Okay, it's good to have everybody back. Jesus Without Religion. Uh, I'm excited to announce we are starting uh, a new section on our YouTube channel. It's going to be called, uh, we're going to build out a category for Ask Me a Question. I get a, a lot of emails on a, a daily basis, and the vast majority of them, well, well, actually all of them, I respond to in writing. And uh, people ask questions, and they, they're all for questions of grace. Sometimes they're actually very confrontational emails, uh, which as long as people can maintain a little bit of godliness, we tend to uh, continue to engage in them. Uh, but I've decided that some of these are really good questions that people ask, and they should be uh, put into some type of a video format where maybe people can watch and we can all learn together. So uh, if you want to participate in that, I would encourage you to email us at info at Jesus without religion.com. That's info at Jesus without religion.com. And we promise uh, we will either respond in writing, as we always do, or we'll put together a video. Now, there's a chance if we do a video, we will probably just mention your first name. And if you prefer that we do not do that, please just let us know. And we will just announce you as someone who uh, has an inquiry that we're addressing for that day. So our first uh, letter uh, email that we're putting in video today, I believe it's March 2nd, is it? Um, yeah, March 2nd, 2022. This one comes from Stormy. And Stormy has uh, a number of things to ask us. And she starts with this. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know any other Stormy. So I'm assuming uh, this is a female name. And I am deeply sorry if I am incorrect. The, uh, Stormy writes, I have confessed, I have confessed and believed that Jesus is Lord and my Savior. But why do people talk about saving grace and all these other things that prove we are saved? Kind of like saving faith. What I mean by that is, oh, yeah, I guess this is what the person, other people are saying. Oh, here's, uh, for example, 15 things that, uh, that you aren't saved, and here's 15 things to prove you are. So I think the very first thing that I would want to do here is I want to point out that this person, uh, Stormy, first sentence says this, I have confessed and believed that Jesus is Lord. Um, how is it that we are saved? Well, we are saved by confessing and believing. Uh, and I would like to just point out a couple of verses here. We see Acts chapter 16, verse 30 teaches us this. It says, and after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must we do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who, everyone who does what? Calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. John 3, 18, the one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only son of God. So what business does anyone have telling someone who says, I'm a believer, I've called on Jesus, I believe he's my Lord. Um, what business does somebody have telling that professing believer that they're not saved? The only person that will be doing that would be someone who is challenging um, and a, a professing believer's salvation, uh, that would be somebody who's not looking at Jesus. And we're going to pull this together. We'll wrap it up. Uh, but it's somebody who's not looking at Jesus for salvation, but rather they're looking at human performance. And today I'm going to show you that that is the last thing we need to be looking at. All right. So let's take a a look at what the Apostle Paul had to say about people who are doing that. Start with Romans chapter 10, it's verse six and seven. He says this, but the righteousness based on, based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, here, what are we told not to do? Do not do this. Don't say it in your heart. Don't speak it with your mouth. Um, don't say who, you don't say who's going to go into heaven. 
Because when you do that, it is to bring Christ down, talking about from the cross. Or don't say, who's going to descend into the abyss? In other words, who wouldn't save? Because that's to put Christ back up from the dead. In other words, if you think you can look at someone and say that they are saved, if you think you can say that they are saved because of their performance, right? You're saying that they're going to heaven because you're evaluating what they're doing and how awesome they look at avoiding sin and all the beautiful works they have. Well, you're not looking at the heart. You're not looking at faith. You're not looking at believing. You might think you are, and it might sound religious and ominous, but you're looking at human performance. And that is what Paul meant when he said, that is to take Christ down from the cross. Meaning, what's the point of Jesus hanging on a cross if we could have been saved in the first place simply by performing better? Can I remind you? There's no shortage of people that hate God that have good works. Then there's the guy um, who's implying that someone's not saved, right? Because you didn't do this. And here's the proof. You didn't do that. And you did that. For example, telling them they're going to, you might as well say you're going to descend into the abyss. Because that's the same thing as I'm saying you're not saved. It's the exact same thing. So this letter is written to the people who are doing that right? When you're challenging someone's salvation because you don't feel like they're doing enough to prove it, you're basically, again, saying that salvation is not through faith and believing Jesus. And that's what the writer means when he says you're basically hanging Jesus right back on a cross again. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Next, um, Stormy writes, I thought the moment you believed and confessed uh, the Lord and have faith, you are eternally secure. So my first response there is you are absolutely correct, because that is exactly what the scriptures teach us, right? It's man, it's lifeless religion that's telling us differently and leading us to potentially doubt because we weigh it. It, it always sounds good. Oh, yeah. Doesn't it sound religious when someone says, yeah, yeah, but you got to be out there. You got to be on fire for the Lord, some might say. You, you got to get out of your comfort zone, some others might say. You got to give until it hurts, a few others would say. And this, you see, this stuff never, ever ends. And once again, it takes the focus off of what Jesus did and slam dunks it right on us. We are told we have eternal salvation. And that word eternal means without an end, right? Jesus, it's funny when we talk about eternal salvation, eternal doesn't only mean without an end. You know, it also means without a beginning. So if you had a birthday, how do you have eternal salvation? Because you had a beginning. And I think that's what we miss. Eternal salvation. It's not your life being prolonged. That eternal is Jesus's life without a beginning or an end being given to you. You get the life of Christ. Christ lives in you and you live in him. So there's only one kind of salvation and it is eternal, right? And it's not secured by our performance, right? This is what we think. We are the, we're the guarantor. Um, we're the one, we're the warranty behind it all. But no, the guarantor uh, is secured by the performance of Jesus Christ on the cross. Next, Stormy writes that why do, uh, and, and I think uh, this was written fairly quickly or by talk to text, so please don't over uh, be critical over the writing. Um, it's overall pretty good. You should see some of my talk to text. I'd rather you not. Um, so next she writes, why do people make it like, oh, if you still show this your entire life, you weren't really saved to begin with, or oh, if you have doubts about salvation, or if you even did it right or do good after you are or stuff like that, uh, you're just being self-righteous. I, I might start by saying um, a lot of doubts in, in some new Christians salvation doesn't come from them. It stems from lifeless uh, legalist people that won't let us trust in the promises of God, but rather they, they take our eyes off of Jesus 
and the guarantees and the promises that he will never leave us, will never forsake us, that it's simply salvation by faith, believing, calling on Jesus. And then they want to start tossing in a bunch of uh, Jewish, lifeless law and works-based type salvation. Why not send them to the altar to slaughter a couple of animals? I mean, let, let's, let's just go all in if we're going to push the Jewish system out there. It, so salvation is not a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new covenant. It's none of the old and all of the new. So let me, first of all, give a disclosure here. Um, Christians are indeed made for good works. God's heart is that we would walk in them. But this idea that Christians, if they fail to do that, would somehow suggest that believing in God, or just telling you, I believe in God, Jesus is Lord, it's no longer true, or it's not enough, or that they never really believe, it's all nonsense. And again, it can sound religious and ominous, but it's nonsense. So once again, when somebody is telling this believer that they need to show it in their entire life, they're taking Christ down from the cross. They're looking at performance and totally ignoring that the person has confessed with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in their heart that Jesus has the power and authority to save them. Now, you might say, Mike, is there a biblical argument for what you just said? Because, boy, the religious guy is not having it. But can people really be saved if they've confessed in the Lord and find themselves still, I call it like it is, wallowing in sin? I would point you to the letter to the Corinthians. These people, man, they were filthy. They were breaking world records for sin. I mean, they're fornicating, they're drunkards, they're abusing the Lord's Supper, they're committing every kind of sin imaginable, right? These people were just absolutely out of their minds with sin. So again, th this was literally a city that was like Vegas on steroids. And I guess in their mind, they felt like, you know, our sins are forgiven, we're under grace. And they stupidly are abusing that and they're using their freedom in Christ and their total forgiveness as a promise from God. And they're taking that as a reason to please the flesh. And if anyone suggests that these people were not believers, that these Corinthians were unbelievers, they would have to commit intellectual suicide. And I think they would have to deny, I don't know, somewhere around, if not more than 50 uh, words that were used by the writer to address them as such. Here's a couple. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 4. God has given them grace. We see that's what God did for them. We see that these people here in verse 16, all this is in just the first chapter, right? They do not lack any spiritual gifts. How many? They don't lack any. God's given them grace. We then discover in verse 8 that Christ will also do what? Keep them firm to the end. How long? To the end, so that they will be blameless on the day of our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 8. And then finally, he calls them brothers. That says, and it should have said, he calls them brothers and sisters. Folks, I'm only into the 10 verses, first 10 verses of chapter 1. You can journey through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, and it's nonstop. Like the, the, the language used to describe these people never once refers to them as anything but children of God. Okay, let's move on here. All right, so next, Storm writes this, but the Bible says, by grace you've been saved, or I'm sorry, it says, by grace you will do good things. I feel the constant urge to do great things. I love this read. I want to reach people. I want to be better. But in my mind, I get these weird things and then people teaching false things like, oh, you're trying to please God by yourself. And it's again, self-righteous behavior. So actually, I'm going to say this, the Bible, it does not say by grace, you will do good things. Uh, the Bible says by grace, you have been saved. And again, I want to reiterate, yes, are we called to do good things? Yes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we all do. I also want to point out again that there are people who reject Jesus. They deny the existence of God. 
um, that do really good things. They give away millions of dollars. They help charity. They walk old ladies across the street. Uh, I would say there are some atheists that are that look a whole lot nicer and good or making words up here than un, than believers do. This is why we absolutely we have no business obsessing over someone else's performance. Right. And there's a reason you feel uh, that I'm talking to Stormy here. There's a reason that you feel this constant urge to do good things. It's because God has given you a new heart. It's because God has given you new desires. It's because God keeps his promises. He put his spirit in you. He's, the scriptures tell us that God has poured his love into you. And the, the reality is you simply need to recognize who you are. And the more we believe it and we, we reject these uh, hateful messages from everyone who's trying to evaluate everything we do, the more we will renew our mind and we will live out that identity. But when someone's constantly making you measure everything you do, it's very difficult to live out uh, a good identity when you're basically being told your identity stinks. I want to read Ezekiel 36, 26. Here's a promise. He says, moreover, I will give you a, a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. And I'm going to remove that old heart of stone from your flesh and give you a new heart. So how do we please God, right? Is God all jacked up because we're performing well? Is he like, look at you, look at me, God. Did you see me on that mission trip? Oh, God, look at me. Did you see all that money that I gave? Look at me, God. Did you see me out there on fire for you? Pounding our chest, arrogantly thinking somehow that we could have God smiling. Oh, thank you, gosh, you're amazing. Never should we be focusing on how awesome we are. Never, but people do it all the time. That's why, and that's usually the people who are telling us, oh, you're not saved. Look at you, look at you, look at you. We're not looking at Christ. We're looking at ourselves. And again, yes, absolutely. Let's have some amazing outward performance. But let's see what the scriptures tell us about what gets God all excited. Let's start here. Acts chapter seven, verse um, 25. He says, God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. I'm be honest with you guys. In other words, get over yourself. You might think you're on fire for the Lord and God just up there clapping and uh, throwing Frisbees around and how awesome you are. And you're going to get all these hooked up with rewards. Another garbage teaching, but that's for another day. Um, the reward is Christ, folks. God is not served by human hands. He's God. He doesn't need you for anything. He doesn't need. He doesn't, I'm not saying we shouldn't do these things, but he doesn't need you to share the gospel. He doesn't need you uh, to give money. He doesn't need you. Now, are we called to do these things? Yeah, but he's God. I mean, get over yourself. Seriously. John 6, 28, 29. Then they asked him, now check this out. This is some uh, religious elites. Here they are. They're, they're, they're trying to corner Jesus. They said, what must we do, Jesus, to do the good works of God, or to do the good works of God? I want you to notice the highlight in that S because they got a question. What are all the amazing works, plural, that's going to get God excited? Now, this is a great time for Jesus to say, yeah, you need to be on fire for the Lord. You got to avoid sin, man. You got to get out there and get out of your comfort zone, man. This ain't about fire insurance. Folks, Jesus says, no, the work singular, the work of God, this is what pleases him is to believe in the one who he has sent. So I'm telling you right now, you got one guy who maybe we're both Christians and one guy's over here talking about, you got to do more, got to be more, got to try harder. You got another guy over there who maybe he's not doing so well, um, but he can look you in the eye and say, man, I'm broken, I'm busted up and I'm not proud of some of the stupid things I do. But man, I'm gonna tell you where I won't waver. I believe the promises of God. I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sins. I believe he has the authority to do it. I believe he is who he says he is, that he will never leave me and never forsake me. And he has taken my sins away. And I'm not saying that justifies more sin, but darn it, you're not going to take Jesus from me. I believe God. Who believes God more? The guy with the great outward performance or the guy who's not going to let you take his confidence in Jesus Christ away from them? All right, so two more, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. What pleases God? Well, I love this. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
meaning you can do all the stuff in the world. Doesn't matter. He's God. He's not served by human hands. What God cares about is, do you believe him what he said about Jesus? Now, to the one who works, Romans 4 or 5, now to the one who works, tries hard, gets on fire, the wages are not credited as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the godly, it is his faith that is credited as righteousness. Now, the apostle Paul is certainly saying, do not work, that the legalist guy, if they heard that from the first time from me, they'd say, oh, so you're saying we shouldn't work. I'm not saying that. Come on. Neither is the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul is making clear, listen, get over yourself. It is not your work that saves you. People take some of these verses out of context, and then they see these, and they just, eh, I don't really have an answer for that. We'll just grab onto the one that really puts you in bondage to the law. All right, let's continue. Next, uh, Stormy writes, which I always want to please and be obedient, but even some people said when you worship, it could just be to please you, and when you read to please uh, you, I don't know. It's definitely weird, but uh, like this weird and nervous, but burning thing in my chest. People turn it in, into a circle. Um, could you clarify the question? And again, man, can, can legalists not just rip out our joy and our, our security in Christ? Um, usually when somebody says they want to be obedient, the first thing I do is I say, well, what are you trying to be obedient to? What or who? You see, lifeless religion would suggest that you need to be obedient to the law. You're not going to find that anywhere in scripture uh, and under the new covenant. They're suggesting that obedience is that, you know, you shall not do this and you shall do that. And if you do this, you better do that. And while it is, again, I know I sound like a broken record because I don't want people to hear what I'm not saying. Again, it is. It is important to avoid sin, not for more forgiveness, not for more love, because of who we are. The Apostle Paul said in no uncertain terms that we are indeed free in Christ. He said that all things, how much? All things are permissible. He can do whatever he wants. He said all things are lawful. Everything. Now, you can water that down all you want. That means I can do anything I want to. Now, stop right there. Oh, so you're saying it doesn't matter. No, I'm not. As a matter of fact, Apostle, Apostle Paul clears it up by saying, hey, I'm not going to take advantage of it. I am free in Christ. My sins have been taken away. I'm totally free. What's going to happen if I do stupid stuff? Nothing. My sins are taken away. God will never leave me or forsake me. I have eternal salvation. Do you believe God? So the point is, just because all things are permissible doesn't mean we need to go out and commit violent sins or ignorant sins, uh, murders against the law in, in the United States of America. But if that law were removed, you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to go out and kill people. It's not because it's not the law that keeps me from doing it, right? It's just who I am as a person, right? So what are, what are we, why are we trying to be obedient to something? a law, uh, rules and regulations that may sound ominous, but they have no value in leading us away from indulging the flesh. True obedience is believing God that Jesus came and died and paid for your sins so that you may have eternal life. It's believing that Jesus is the son of God and has the authority to give you that life. That is when you have become obedient. As a matter of fact, what once you uh, have put your trust in Jesus and not a bunch of fleshy works, Romans 6, 17 tells us something very interesting. It says, you have become obedient from the heart. So we're not trying to be obedient hearts as Christians. We're not trying to have obedient hearts. We always have an obedient heart. You have become. It's not, in a, pro it's not a process because your obedience is not by what you do. It's what you believe. So I'm saying that there are some people out there that view, they, they view us as sinners who are trying to please Christ. And I submit to you, that's not who we are. We are blameless Christians trying to avoid sin. All right, a couple more slides here. Next, uh, Stormy concludes by saying, um, I do know he and the disciples talk a lot to unbelievers, etc." 
that people twist verses with, uh, but why do people twist this to practically everywhere? I agree. Uh, I think, of course, I'm spiritually immature, as many people are, by the way, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm spiritually immature is also, I get confused. FYI, maybe, uh, though, this is my first question, I came from an uh, apostolic uh, church to now non-denominational, so maybe that has a huge part in renewing my mind. Uh, I'm under grace, not law, but I'm uh, I'm trying to get the spirit to guide me and learn and grow. I just don't want uh, I just don't want to be misdirected zeal or doubt, even though I know Christians question their faith and salvation. I just don't <clears throat> think nor want them to be. By the way, we're not saved by whether or not we question our salvation. By the way, I think everyone at one time or another questions everything. We should. Let's be open-minded. Let's be human. Let's use our brain. Question it because we want to know that we're saved and we can. Sometimes I think, pe I think uh, people think our spiritual matureness is according to our performance, Stormy, uh, or how well we know the Bible, right? I believe spiritual maturity is people who simply trust God and believe the promises of Jesus. And I would point out that for hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus Christ, well, no one had a Bible. There were no brick and border churches for the longest time. Most people couldn't even read if there was a Bible, right? Christians did just fine being spiritually mature without knowing scriptures, without going on mission trips or any of this stuff. So I think in the scriptures, we actually read about Christians being immature. We see it in Hebrews and they need, they're in need of milk before they can get meat. But the context isn't about performance. The actual context, and we do a study on Hebrews. You can find that on our website, jesuswithoutreligion.com. Um, the context is that the letter is describing people who are jacked up and they're pushing legalistic, it's Jewish people, by the way, it's in Hebrews, hence Jewish people. They're pushing legalistic law-based messages for salvation. And we learn that they are not ready for meat because they, if, because they have a, if they, they haven't truly understood the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace, saved by faith through grace, a gift and not of yourself. And they got a message that's the exact opposite. Sounds like the kind of people Stormy's been talking to. And let's talk about Christians who question their faith and salvation. What would cause anyone to do that? And I'll tell you what it is. It would be because you're examining your performance in that it's become your measuring stick for faith and salvation. And I would encourage you to stop doing that immediately. Yes, we absolutely should avoid sin. I've said it 20 times, I think. Uh, yes, let's exude the love of Jesus and let good works flow from within. It's who we are. We're made for good works. But don't let those be your measuring stick for who you are in Christ. Let Christ be your measuring stick. God does not want you doing these things, right? God wants you to know that you will stand before him on judgment day with complete confidence. And I'm going to leave you with these final verses here. Um, 1 John chapter 5, verses 10 through 13, he says, the one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself, right? So he has the testimony in himself. Who is that person? Who has the testimony? The one who did what? Works hard, tries hard, does? No, nope. believes in the Son of God. There's nothing in here about works. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And what is that testimony? Well, he tells us. And this is the testimony I'm talking about. What is it? That God has given us eternal life. That's the testimony, right? And this life is in his son. It is in Christ. Christ has given you his life. Eternal, remember, without a beginning, without an end. It's Christ's life given to you, not your life prolonged, right? So he will never leave you. Why will he never leave you? Because God cannot disown himself right? God cannot disown God. And if God lives in you, what are we talking about, right? The one who has the son has the life. And the one who does not have the son of God does not have the life. 
These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Who, who, who is he writing to? The guys like Stormy and the ladies like Stormy, I'm sorry, who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why does he write this thing? Because here's what he wants, Stormy. So that you may know, you may know, never question it, that it is through believing in the Son of God, you are able to know that you have eternal life, regardless of all these religious, lifeless messages from people who want to steal, steal your confidence and security. Don't let them do it. And on a closing thought, um, I don't think there is a single unbeliever on the planet, Stormy, who would ever write into a Christian channel asking questions about Jesus and salvation. That would be like sending a letter to the North Pole telling Santa Claus what we want for Christmas. We only do these things if we believe them to be true, right? Hope you enjoyed that. As always, if you did, be sure to like, comment, and share below. And God bless you all, brothers and sisters.